Actually, for a few weeks, we'll be looking at this portion of Scripture. But I'm going to start in, in 1 Corinthians 1, just to, the uh, 13th chapter of Corinthians is well known as the love chapter. And the, uh, the title this morning is Languages Without Love. And the, the church at Corinth, if you've ever read the books of Corinthians, 1 and 2 Corinthians, they had plenty of trouble. They had plenty of issues. But the, you know, the Bible says they had, they had an abundance of spiritual gifts. In uh, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 5, he says that in everything you are enriched by him, in all utterance and in all knowledge... Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift. Uh, they had spiritual gifts. The problem was a love problem. And uh, God really deals with that in, in the church. They, they had some, some strange moral and spiritual issues. And, uh, you know, it really comes back to our love for the Lord. Uh, they had lots of spiritual activity. In uh, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 20. Listen to this. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. <laughs> it wasn't a problem getting people to do things at the church of Corinth. The problem was getting people to sit and listen. Everybody said, oh, listen to me, listen to me. <laughs> they had plenty of spiritual activity, but they lacked love. And the reason I say that is because of the context of Corinthians. And love is the power behind spiritual gifts. Love is the power behind spiritual activity. You, know, you, can, you can have lots of activity and lots of words and not love the Lord. And that's what we want to look at this morning. We're going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We'll read the whole chapter. It's only a few verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And the theme is the preeminence of love. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Charity. Uh, the preeminence of love. Uh, I'm told the Greeks had four different words for love. Uh, only two are in, in the scriptures. Uh, this is agape love. And now, real love is a wonderful thing. God's love. Agape love has to do with God's love. So when God has a wonderful thing, Satan, of course, wants to distort it. You will hear the word love used a lot. Usually it has nothing to do with love, to be honest with you. you know, quite often when you hear the word love, oh, I love ice cream. <laughs> you know? I mean, it has nothing to do with real love. It has to do with other, other, other things. Agape love is not romantic or sexual love. Agape love is not the emotional, tingly feelings we get or the sentimental things. I mean, you've seen it. Somebody watching a TV show, not even real people, and they cry. Listen, that's not love, all right? That's not what God's talking about. Um, agape love is not a friendly spirit of tolerance and brotherhood. Now, that's another kind of love. He talks about the phileo love, Philadelphia. 
Uh, love is not giving to a nonprofit organization. <laughs> All right? It, 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 that's what I was saying earlier. You know, Satan loves to distort things. God specifically used the word charity here, so Satan makes sure we use charity in a different way. And yeah, we don't think of charity as love. In fact, people will say very vehemently, I don't give me your charity. I, I don't need your charity. Well, what are they saying? If, if they really understood the word, they're saying, I don't want your love. But that's not what they mean. Uh, they're saying, don't show me, uh, don't show pity to me. Don't treat me like I'm an inferior. Uh, agape love is John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, you can put those other things in there and see how wrong they are. God so loved the world that he had a romantic feeling for us. <laughs> no. God so loved the world that he was very sentimental about us. God so loved the world that he had a friendly spirit of tolerance and brotherhood. You can see, that, that's not what it is. Love is self-sacrifice. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You know, real love, you, you do see it. Parents sacrifice to love their children. Sometimes children sacrifice to love their parents. Uh, husbands and wives sacrifice to love each other. You know, there's a lot of situations in life where it would be easier just to do things on your own, but you, you have a relationship and you love that person and, and you put yourself last to love them. Uh, that's what God did for us. We put the other one uh, before ourselves. Uh, God put us uh, in a place of love so that we could uh, be loved. There's a portion of Scripture in John 13 that uh, illustrates this. John 13, verse 1. Let me just read it to you. It says, Before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which are in the world, he loved them unto the end. You know, we, we see Jesus' love. He, he loved them while he was with them. And he illustrates it there uh, here in this chapter, in verse 4, he rises from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wash and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Jesus began to illustrate love. He was their servant. And Peter said, what, what are you doing? <laughs> and what's going on here? Uh, verse 15 Jesus said, I've given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Real love is, is a sacrifice. Real love is, is like Jesus showed uh, to them. Later on in that same chapter, you're probably familiar with these words, verse 34, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved one to another. Now, <laughs> Do people know that we are his disciples? Well, sometimes they, they say, boy, I don't want to be like them. You should hear them talk about those other people at church. <laughs> uh, it used to be, and I, I know none of you would do this, but you know, people used to go home and have a roast pastor for lunch. You know? <laughs> go home and talk about the pastor. You know? uh, listen, God tells us we're to love like Jesus loved. Uh, putting others be before ourselves. He wants us to do the very same. You know, the world, the flesh, and the devil will all try and distort that. The world will try and make you think love is something different than it is. Uh, your flesh, uh, the devil. Um, Jesus showed us his love in his life and especially in his death. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. In uh, John 15, verse 9, Jesus says, as the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. I, I, I've loved the Father. The Father's loved me. Continue ye in my love. Then he says, this is really important. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in, in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I've loved you. Wow, that, he says this is very important. Our loving relationship with God, but also our loving relationship with each other as Christians. Sacrificing our will for God's will. Our theme this year has been, Thy kingdom come. 
And this really is a part of that. You know, sacrificing our will, saying, Lord, you're the king. I want to be what you want me to be. I want to do what you want me to do. Thy kingdom come. Your will be done. Uh, the act of self-sacrifice. Uh, the Bible in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 talks about Jesus, how that who loved me and gave himself for me. That's love. He loved me and gave himself for me. Um, in Matthew 5, he talks about blessed are the poor in, in spirit. It's talking about an emptying of self. You know, that's what Jesus did. You know, he said, not my will, but, but thine be done. Real love is not selfish. It's not all about me. It, it's called obedience. In, in John 14, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And uh, you know, this morning, this, this subject is so important. It, it's really a core issue of the Christian life. Number one, do we love the Lord? And as a result, do we love each other? You know, love goes out of its way. It, it isn't just passive. It isn't just, well, I, if I get the opportunity. No, love is sacrificing our, ourselves to reach out to, to others. Love is the key to living our faith. And uh, we're just going to, it's really just by way of introduction this, this morning, but uh, basically the first thing he's saying there in the preeminence of love is that languages without love are nothing. Really, the way he, ex he expresses it is languages without love are just noise. <laughs> There's plenty of noise in our world, isn't there? It, it always amazes me to see there's so many people who walk around with earbuds, you know, things in their ears. And, and I think, isn't there enough noise? Maybe they're wearing them to get rid of the noise, I don't know. But you know, a lot of times in life, you need to hear what's going on around you. You know, there, there's people crying out, they need your help. Uh, the Lord wants to speak to your heart. And listen, you can't hear the Lord speaking when you got... Oh, I'm going to try and name a, a song group. I wouldn't know one. I'm going to say ACDC. They're probably all dead now. Uh, anyway, uh, you know, when you got noise going in your ears, you're not going to hear the Lord speak. You're not going to hear those who, uh, who are crying out. Recently, they had a day... What did they, I don't remember what they called it, but basically you were supposed to ask people, are you all right? You okay, Day? And you know, how can you do that? How can you even pay any attention to what's going on in people's lives if, if all you're hearing is noise? And some of the noise is going to be you. We've got some little kids in our home right now. Uh, boy, you can get some noise, you know? They roar like a lion or, you know, whatever, or just roar. Uh, uh, there's a lot of noise that can go on. Sometimes it comes from us. And listen, noise doesn't really help. It really doesn't. Now, he's using here... Uh, a grammatical thing called hyperbole. Hyperbole. It looks like hyperbole if you see it written out. It's a statement exaggerated for effect. He's making a real strong statement, but that's the illustration. Don't get mixed up with the illustration for what he's trying to teach here. Okay? Yeah, uh, hyperbole would be like saying, man, I'm so hungry, I could eat a horse. You could say, oh, well, that's a lie. You couldn't eat a horse. No, it's, you're just you're exaggerating for effect. You're not lying. You're just saying, I'm really hungry. And that's what he's, he's doing here. Uh, he's using very strong words. God is not saying you have to speak in tongues here. We're going to touch on that this, this morning. Um, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 here, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and, and so on. Then he, he goes into it in chapter 14 and Acts chapter 2. And uh, he talks about this thing of, uh, of tongues. In Acts chapter 2, when, when the, the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit... Uh, filled them, it says they spake with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. It was something that went on. And uh, if you read that chapter there in Acts chapter 2, uh, it, it says in verse 6, you know, the multitude came together. It says they were confounded because every man heard them speak in his own language. This wasn't angel talk. This wasn't Babel. And then he lists, uh, I counted 15 different groups of different uh, language groups. Fifteen different ones, and it says, verse 11, the last two are Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. There was a gift of tongues that God gave, and it was the gift to be able to speak a language you didn't know, so that people could hear the wonderful works of God. Now, the Bible tells us a few things about that, and the Greek word has to do with glossolalia. People today like to use that word because it sounds kind of special. It just means languages. 
in intelligent speech. But many people over the centuries have tried to make it babble. Just letting your tongue loose and saying things that, that make no sense. Uh, some of, the Lord uses the expression here, the tongues of men and of angels. And some people say, well, we're going to have to learn to talk angel talk. But let me tell you something. You read the Bible, you'll find every time an angel talks to a person, he talks the language they understand. That's angel talk. Angel talk makes sense to the person you're talking to. We have a thing recently about two-year-olds. <laughs> and it's not just our two-year-old. I had, the other day, where was I? Somebody else's house. Oh, Lewis and Sophie's house. And a little two-year-old was sitting there, and he was very friendly, and he looked at me, and he talked for about a minute, and he said absolutely nothing. <laughs> That's not communication except for the smile. <laughs> you know, and it was, uh, my stock answer to two-year-olds is, you know, I've often thought that. <laughs> and they, that seems to satisfy them. Well, listen, that's, that's not angel talk, all right? Angels make sense to the person they're talking to. By the way, two-year-olds, they don't know it yet, but they, they think that they rule the world. Uh, they don't know that they don't, but uh, don't tell them. They'll learn, learn soon enough. Angels, uh, angels communicated to people. In fact, they're messengers. That, that's what the word angel means. They're a messenger. What kind of messenger would it be if they stood in front of you and spoke gobbledygook that you had no idea what they're talking about? That wouldn't be a messenger. That would be uh, irritating. <laughs> it would be strange. Um, some people have made up this idea of, of a prayer language. But well, that doesn't come from Scripture. Uh, that doesn't fit the Bible description. But one man actually researched it. His name was William Samarin. He was a PhD in linguistics. He looked into all this gobbledygook, the, you know, the babble, the, just the, the words that, that make no sense. He, he said, no modern speaking in tongues made any sense. And he called it linguistic nonsense. Some will even offer to teach you how to do it. It's not a known language, and it doesn't fit uh, with the Bible. The Bible does use sometimes that word unknown. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 27, and other places. Many man speak in an unknown tongue. You'll notice in your Bible it's in, in italics. Any word you have in italics means it's not in the original. It's there for the sense of the thing. And the word unknown there is not that it's unknown to everybody. It's that it's unknown to the speaker. It's a spiritual gift. It's a special thing that, that God was doing. And one of the main reasons he did that, we'll look at it more later, is that people needed to know this was of God. Uh, Babel has been a characteristic of heathen worship and demon possession for hundreds of years. And it's practiced even today by many of the cults. For me personally, I have never had a moment's worry about speaking in tongues ever since I learned that Mormons today speak in tongues. The babble that, that we're talking about, not languages, just gobbledygook. To me, that settled it. Uh, that's not of the Lord. Uh, the thing that should settle is, is what the, the scripture has to say. The heathen of Paul's day practiced it. Uh, when they worshiped Sabeel and Dionysius, they spoke in ecstatic languages accompanied by clanging cymbals, smashing gongs, and blaring trumpets. That's his reference in verse 1. I'm become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. That's the reference he's making there, was to heathen worship of his day. And boy, they had lots of language, but it was just noise. Folks, that's not what we want. We don't need more words. <laughs> we, need, we do need the truth to get out. We do need to communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's plenty of words out there. Well, it's embarrassing sometimes. I turned on my radio in my car the other day and somebody swore at me before I could even change it. Use vile language to me. You know, there's plenty of language out there. What we need is the truth. We need to communicate the wonderful works of Christ like they were doing. Um, and what he's saying here is the, the tongues that are being used today is, is a heathen, heathen, heathen thing. Um, Tongues had a purpose. It wasn't selfish. Now, it gets confusing because we use the word tongues in the real way and in the, in the false way. The real way is languages that people could hear and understand. Tongues had a purpose. 
And the main purpose was for people to hear the wonderful works of God and to see this is of the Lord. But it also had a use by date. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, we read verses 8 through 10. Uh, did you notice in the middle there of verse, uh, verse 8, he says, Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. At that time, the scripture was not complete. And when the Bible was completed, and God says it is, that's where we go for our authority. That's where our faith is. It's not in some miracle. It's not in some strange spiritualistic thing. If people will not believe the word of God, they won't believe God. It's like uh, God said to the, to the man in hell, he said, even if you sent your brother from, to talk to him, even if you could go and talk to your brothers, he said, if they won't believe the scriptures, if they won't believe Moses, they're not going to believe them. If people won't submit to the word of God, they're not going to submit to God. So what, I'm saying a lot of things to say one, one main point this morning. Don't misuse this illustration and miss the message. The message is that we need to love the Lord and love his people. Look at verses 1 through 3. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. What he's saying here, he, at the end of each verse, he basically comes down to nothing. He says, without love, our, our lives are just noise. Um, without love, we are nothing. At the end of verse 2, I am nothing. Without love, I accomplish nothing. The end of verse 3. If I don't have charity, it profiteth me nothing. And you know, the thing that came to me, the thing that I've made me think about is there's so much religion in the world. I mean, well, there's no lack of religion. There's so much activity and so many words and so on. And we have a lot of noise and action, but we accomplish nothing without the love of Christ. Listen, there, there are religions today who are, who are, are preaching against Christ. Uh, there are religions today who are, are preaching another gospel and so on. Listen, without the love of God, we accomplish nothing. And, man, there's some wonderful buildings, some even nicer than ours. Hard to believe that. You know, beautiful buildings, man, they've got all kinds of accomplishments. Some of them will have wonderful speeches. They'll talk a lot better than I do. <laughs> you know, it'll, it'll roll off the tongue. Lots of words, beautiful music. I was hearing uh, something this week, uh, some nuns singing. Oh, it sounded lovely. But you know, without the love of Christ, they've wasted their life. What a pity. It makes me so sad when I see someone commit themselves to something without the love of God. They can be very religious. They can be very nice people. Uh, they can be uh, used in, in, in other ways. You know, without the love of God, it accomplishes nothing. It does not accomplish what God wants. In Acts 4.12, he says, Neither is there salvation in any other. There's none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Uh, look at verse 2 there in, in 1 Corinthians 13. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. Did you notice the alls there? He said, if you knew all mysteries, some people really like to ferret things out in the scripture. Oh, what does that mean? And what's going to happen there? If you understood every little nuanced statement in the scriptures, if you had all knowledge, if you had all faith, you remember that hyperbole? Listen, nobody has all of those, except God. Do you think Paul would have walked over all those mountains if he could have just said to the mountain, excuse me, <laughs> you know, if I have enough faith that, you know, God said, pray and move a mountain, you know, if you have a whole faith, you could do that. Why would Paul not just do that if he had all faith? Um, even if I could have all faith, even if I could talk angel talk, even if I was the best talker in the whole world, it would do no good without love. That's the point. Don't miss the point. 
God is saying, if you're trying to please him by your fleshly activity, you're no better than the heathen. Now, thinking about it this week, there's a lot of things we can do that without the love of God, they just become false works. You can even go out witnessing because it makes you feel better. You can come to church because, oh, it makes me feel better. Listen, you need to do it because you love the Lord. Now, I hope coming to church makes you feel better sometimes. Sometimes I hope it makes you feel worse. To be honest with you, it should. But we should come because we love the Lord. We should witness because we love the Lord. Not to make ourselves uh, out 24 hours this week talking to people. No, it's not to promote us. And the, the point he's making here is if we think that our activity is going to make the Lord love us, we're no better than the heathen. We don't do these things to make the Lord love us. We do it because we love the Lord. There's a big difference. Romans 7, he says, In me that's in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Now listen, we can't please the Lord by our, our, our activity. And it could be any activity that, that makes you, you feel better. Much of what goes on in Christian churches today is really just paganism. It's just people saying... This is what I want to do. Listen, whether you... Well, let me put it this way. We need to grow up. Your kids do what makes them happy. I remember our kids, they'd, they'd say, yeah, I've told you this a hundred times, oh, I don't, I don't like that food, Dad. That's okay, son. You don't have to like it. Just eat it. <laughs> I've seen adults do that, and I have to bite my tongue, but... Uh, yeah, as adults, we don't just do what makes us feel good. You know, a lot of you get up in the morning and you don't think, oh boy, I get to go to work. <laughs> you think, oh, I'm going to work. You, know? you do it because it's right. You do it because you love your family. You do it because you love the Lord and you want to be a good testimony. You know? Uh, we need to be careful that we're not children. He talks there in, in Corinthians about putting away childish things. We'll talk about that more another time. But uh, you know, as Christians... We don't need to try and get God's favor by our activity. God loves you. He'll never love you any more. He'll never love you any less. God loves you. He doesn't change. <laughs> and we need to honor Him by loving Him in return. See, the love starts. The number one part of love is God loved us. Here in His love, not that we love God, but that He loved us. He gave His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. We love Him because He first loved us. Our response to his love needs to be love. You don't have to worry that God will love you. God does love you. you to, to serve him. Christian, let me ask you, are you loving God? Are you loving others? Are you sacrificing yourself to do it? Are you humbling yourself? Are you giving your time, giving your pride, so that you can just love the Lord? You know, it's, it's sometimes when you identify with the Lord, uh, People will mock you. People in some parts of the world, they'll kill you. They'll, they'll hurt you. But you know, what an honor to be identified with the God of the universe. The God who loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son. Hard to imagine that kind of love. In, in 1 John chapter 5 and, and verse 3, God says, This is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. It, we obey him. We serve him. And it's not grievous. It's not a, a pain in the neck to do it for the Lord. It's, a, it's an honor. You know, it's when you get saved, we often talk about the first step of obedience is scriptural baptism. It's not a pain. It's not a grief. It's, a, it's an honor to identify with the Lord. Uh, you know, being a part of a church, uh, witnessing to people, reading our Bible and praying, you know, it's, oh, no, I've got to read my Bible. No, it's an honor. It's a blessing. Are you loving him? Are you obeying him? He said in John 13, we, we read it earlier, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Not to get his favor, but because we love him. Maybe this morning you don't know the Lord as your Savior. Maybe you're a religious person, or maybe you're not, but you're not sure if you died, whether you'd go to heaven or hell, or, or what would happen. 
The Bible says that he's written these things that you may know that you have eternal life. God wrote it out so that you wouldn't have to go by my opinion or by my words. God wrote it out. And he said there in 1 Corinthians, when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Listen, you don't have to have a vision from me. You don't have to have special words from me or someone else. Go straight to God and see how to know him. And God says, you know, very simply that we're all sinners. And he says the wages of our sin is separation from him. A holy God can't be part of sin. And yet God gave his son to become sin for us. That's love, folks. The thing he hates the most, he became so that we could be saved. Yeah, God is so incredibly inventive. You see it in creation. God made things that we're never even going to see that are beautiful. You know? Uh, microscopic, magnificent things in the bottom of the ocean and so on. Well, God took that terrible thing called death and he made it the remedy for our sin by taking it upon himself. That's love. That's an amazing God uh, who loved us and gave himself for us. Uh, let me encourage you. I'm not sure about your relationship to the Lord. Uh, God loves you. He proved it on the cross. He showed his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. And what God wants from you is not your religious activity. It's you. God wants you to have a, a relationship with him. And it's by faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. And the Bible says faith is believing God's word. What God has done and who he is. Now, the disciples were asked, what do we need to do to be saved? They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And thou shalt be saved. It's as simple as that. It's, it's in a person. I remember some years ago, a, a woman had come to our church and had heard about salvation. and uh, She'd heard, uh, you know, how you needed to pray and ask the Lord to, to save you. And, and uh, I think it was the next week, she said, uh, yeah, I went home. I was really impressed with that. She said, I went home and I said the words. She said, and I told my husband, and he said the words too. Listen, words without love just will not make it. It's not a magic formula. It's not just words. It's a relationship. And God has, has, has given his love to us. He's shown his love to us. And Jesus said we need to be born again. You must be born again. What a wonderful Savior it is. Uh, this is just the beginning of the things we're going to look at here in 1 Corinthians 13. And I, wanna, I want you to see this, uh, this main point this morning. Uh, languages without love are just just noise, and uh, that to try and please the Lord by our physical activities, to try and have a relationship with him by our, our efforts, uh, is just, it's just heathenism. We've got to come God's way. And God says the only way is through Jesus Christ, by faith in Christ. Let's go to the Lord in, in prayer this morning. The Lord is speaking to your heart. Uh, I'd encourage you to do business with him and uh, make sure that... Uh, you're right with, with the Lord today. Father, thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you for your word that speaks to our hearts. And we're thankful that your love is, is real and that Jesus really came and really died and was buried and rose again and that we really can, can trust and have our sins forgiven. Thank you for the reality of faith and of eternity. Lord, I pray that, there would, that you'd be speaking to our hearts and if, if there are those that are not saved, that They'd understand this and that they would turn to you in faith believing. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.